Magnus, okay. the floor is yours. Thank you very much. All right. Welcome to this uh, Celsius talk. Uh, it will be about financial instruments, funding, and some, uh, we will talk about challenges and some success stories and some ideas behind key learnings and solutions. The one having this seminar today or webinar or talk is uh, Celsius, and I will give you a short presentation to Celsius. All right, Amelia, please. Switch slide. Sorry. So Celsius has been around, uh, it was an idea in uh, 2012. Uh, it has an ambition to accelerating the energy transition in cities. And uh, the focus is uh, on the uh, integrated heating and cooling energy systems. Could you please switch slide, Nina? Yeah. We start from the city's perspective and the utilities in the cities to be uh, support for them in getting the systems in the ground and commission them. And uh, if you have the next slide, please, Amelia. Uh, we are, we've been around for a while and we are more than 70 cities uh, taking part of Celsius. You know, everybody have an ambition to uh, work with energy transition and all of the partners here, all the European cities here is having also heating and cooling as a part of their energy system. We are many partners working with the city, uh, with Celsius. It's uh, we have Gothenburg Energy, Johannesburg Science Park, Rise and IMCT, and you Eden Power, which is, uh, is on the office every day working with this. Uh, we're also funded by Key Climate, the uh, European Commission, and uh, some energy agencies as the Swedish Energy Authority. So that's short about Celsius. So next, uh, next slide, please, Emilia. So this talk, uh, this talk is uh, about being successful in the transition from a sustainable demonstrator to commission and replication. I mean, we have so many successful demonstrators around, uh, but it's hard to get them into commission. And there are several aspects of why we're not successful in the way we'd like to be. Uh, there are many things, but today we will focus on one of them, which is financial investments and of course if we don't succeed with this it's uh, we will have hard to succeed with a energy transition and uh, next slide please Emilia. and and that that is important that is important i mean uh, the cities uh, we are all living in we represent about 60 percent of the global energy consume, consumption uh, we stand for 70 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions so that is of course of course, important that we succeed here. All right, next slide, please, Emilia. And I mean, you've probably been around for many of those seminars regarding financial instruments and uh, scaling and replicability, and we are definitely not alone. Uh, Celsius has been working with this since the design of the project design in 2012, and there has been many initiatives, probably been around longer than us, uh, but what we can see now, there's a lot of initiatives popping up regarding this area, financial instruments and financial uh, funding and replication and scaling. And in this, in this, where we are today, we are supported by some projects, some lighthouse projects, which uh, put effort into this uh, work. Um, and we, we also have support from the Climate Kick, which is working with this. And uh, as well as the European Commission and your heat and power. So we're, we're a mix of three where we try to push this uh, forward, all of us. All right, next slide. So what, why, is this, why do we talk about this at all? Uh, what's the issue? So uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah. What we can see, uh, why we are working with this, uh, as we said, is a key part of uh, getting the energy position, but there, we, we, there is something else. When we knew the Celsius, they said that the working financial instruments is the main obstacle of uh, getting from a good, good demonstrator to commission it and replicate it in scale. Uh, when we talk to the financial area, financial instruments, they said uh, it's not an issue with financing capital, there's an abundance of capital available for this kind of investment. And uh, if you took Take the next slide, Emilia. 
one more, please. Uh, you can see, so the focus today uh, will be some where, where we've been, where our partner has been successful handling the gap from going to uh, demonstrators to commissioning. And uh, we will also think, look at it from a, a European perspective, from the city perspective and from the investor perspective today. So this is a sneak peek into a, a report and a presentation we will have for European Commission here in the future. So, Emilia, next slide, please. So today, we will have five different speakers today, uh, where we look into a European perspective regarding financial instruments. We have Simon White, Greater London Authority, and uh, he's been uh, heading European Union's Urban Agenda for Energy Transition. We have Christina Lindner, which is an expert in the challenges uh, for district heating. And we have Rolf Bastian from Baxter Company, who have been working a lot with the investor challenges. So they will be presenting. And one more slide, please, Emilia. And we also have some success stories today and key learnings from Rodrigo, who has been an energy capital manager for Bunhill in Islington, which is a, bar a borough of uh, London. And uh, they've been very successful from a proof of concept to commissioning. So that will be an interesting story. And then we're from Gothenburg have Fredrik Block. He's a portfolio manager for the city of Gothenburg, the treasury. And he's uh, skilled in green bonds and he will give some uh, key learnings. So, next slide please. And uh, myself, my name is Magnus Anderson. I'll, uh, I work a lot with financial engineering, financial instruments. Uh, I'm usually at IMCG, but here today I'm working as uh, from the Celsius Initiative uh, with a focus on financial instruments. So that's the introduction, Emilia. Now let's uh, give the floor to Simon. Please give us some uh, introduction into European Union's agenda regarding energy transition partnership. Thanks very, much, thanks very much, Magnus. Thanks very much, Magnus. Uh, for that. Um, basically, I'm just going to give you a very brief sort of introduction to some of the work that sort of we've been doing in the um, urban agenda in the energy transition partnership, and sort of the re specifically the reason being sort of um, one of the workshops coming out of that is that it's looking at um, financing for district energies. That's been sort of part of that part for the um, webinar this morning. So Magnus, explain. You go to the next one, please. Yeah. Ready to go to the next slide. Ah, thank you. Bear. So yeah, um, urban agenda. What is the urban agenda? And um, basically, sort of uh, a recognition is this sort of uh, EU to recognise increasing levels of urbanisation, lots of activity happening, and the really important role that it's easy to play in the sort of sustainable development of, of the continent and its budget from a social perspective, from an economic perspective, and from an environmental perspective. And as part of that, the um, urban agenda was established through the Pact of Amsterdam, sort of during the Dutch presidency in 2016. And as part of that, they wanted to bring cities much closer to policy making and to implementation of policy and to sort of um, these are, um, great levels of engagement with the, um, with the EU, with the Commission, as well as sort of their national governments, so that sort of as policy developed, um, it was more reflective of the, sort of the needs and requirements of cities, but also recognise the very important role that cities have to play in this. Okay, Amelia, can we go to the next slide, please? Sure, and just a quick detail, if you could speak a little bit closer to the microphone, the sound is a little bit yeah, bad. Yeah, sure. Thank is you. that a little bit better? Much better, thank you. Right, sorry. Uh, yeah, so as I mentioned, sort of the objective is sort of the um, urban agenda is like sort of to engage urban authorities sort of more in policy development implementation. And sort of as part of the initiative, there were sort of three key areas, better funding, better knowledge and better regulation, sort of areas which were sort of um, partnerships were being encouraged to sort of look at as sort of ways to um, support development of urban areas. Um, this is the Energy Transition Partnership. It's sort of one of 14 partnerships set up under the urban, under the urban agenda. Other ones include sort of, uh, circular economy, 
impacts, uh, climate change adaptation, housing, economic development, jobs and skills. So you can sort of see a range of challenges that cities face um, with increasing urbanisation, sort of all with sort of active areas. And sort of with a partnership was sort of made up of organisations, cities, um, member states and members of the commission and then also sort of um, other other partners and things as well. You can see at the bottom of the slide is a sort of illustration of um, other partners. Um, basically sort of we had a sort of a high level vision looking at security and resilience of energy, affordable, fair and equitable and clean and sustainable energy systems supporting the delivery of um, <coughs> getting us to zero carbon and sort of we sort of set a sort of an objective to try and change the sort of the dynamic of energy systems as well sort of moving and um, to a such much more sort of demand led smarter more integrated and interconnected energy system which will ultimately be zero carbon and thank you Amelia could you go to the next one Simon, do you, could you close for us so we have some in one minute so we can have some uh, if there are any yep. questions? Yeah, yep. certainly. Yeah. And then just to sort of say that sort of we set up some working groups, we set up a sort of looked at the energy, system, at the energy system being sort of broken up into sort of four main component parts and sort of and we set up um, working groups around those. We had sort of energy sources, energy storage and distribution sort of as an important area we had sort of energy master planning and sort of smart platforms and controls sort of around energy management that could act, act both a system and building level then really importantly for us from an energy systems perspective essentially you've got the buildings consumers and consumption sort of in that that as well so sort of those were the sort of areas we worked and how that we worked in and um, launched in sort of May 2019 and sort of in that were sort of five key actions that we sort of established. One, as I mentioned, sort of looking at being able to sort of support development to financing energy. And we also sort of working on maximizing use of waste heat to decarbonize the city. And a guidance on energy master planning for cities, recognizing the fundamental role that plays. Also an important element being retrofit, sort of looking at sort of deployment desks and coordinating city level retrofit. And then sort of finally there was something on looking at the role that EU funding has to sort of support the energy transition. So that's all for me. And a question, a uh, question. Uh, what do you expect from our group, the one working with financing for district energy? What, in the best of worlds, what would you like to see from us? Uh, in our short paper. Yeah, I suppose sort of um, what we'd like to sort of see, see there is a sort of a synthesis of some of the barriers to delivering um, district energy networks in cities, sort of what the opportunities are, the roles that district energy networks are able to play, not only at a local city level, but also sort of in integration with the sort of the national and European level system. So the role that energy and um, district energy can sort of play in balancing and flexibility and greater levels of revenue. And then obviously, right. sort of how do we fund that? <laughs> and then yeah. sort of engaging with the commission and sort of seeing whether or not there's a um, working group where we can bring greater levels of stakeholders together to sort of discuss, to, to discuss ways of sort of raising and making finance available. Thank you, that's great. Uh, I think we, we will save some questions for later on. Uh, I think we will let the next speaker, Christina, uh, enter the stage because uh, she will present uh, some of the learnings uh, and challenges which we see from a mainly from a city perspective. Christina, thank you, Simon. Thank you very much. Uh, and Christina, uh, are you ready to uh, present? Yes, I'm ready. Yes. I hope you hear me. I'm moving close to the mic. So thank you for this opportunity to. Um, talk to this audience about some learnings that we have made in a big project called Reuse Heat um, on challenges to the district heat in Can you please change the slide? Great, thank you. So we will discuss five points. First, we have identified that there is a large urban waste heat potential uh, we see that very little of it is used, but uh, we could do much more. We have also identified that we have a um, problem because there is a lack of standardization 
in this new area of district heating and we have an unclear regulatory framework on the waste heat recovery overall. We also think that we need some policy changes for full effect because the cost of carbon is still too low to reach the 2050 targets. And we see that there is an explicit interest to invest in the district heating and cooling sector, but there appears to be some pieces of puzzle missing to make it happen. So please change the slide. So returning to the reuse heat project where we gain our knowledge from, um, we have an idea that is uh, based on a city level and a city should really be able to heat itself based on people um, performing activities on a daily basis. People go to work, they use maybe the metro, people use the lavatory, we have sewage water that generates heat. Um, people use public spaces like hospitals, they also generate heat. And everything we do is based on the computer or laptop generating excess heat from data centers. And what we do in the project is to um, demonstrate um, urban waste heat recovery in district heating systems. Please change the slide. The project in short, um, it's a four year project with four demo sites. We have 16 partners in nine countries, budget of 5 million euro. So apart from the technical side, we have tried to look at the heat potential and what happens if we use it, if we start using these urban sources in the energy system. We have identified who is interested, uh, what needs are there, how can we satisfy them. Uh, and then the demo site, as I mentioned, but we have also focused on business models of contracts and um, investment risks and bankability, which is quite unique for this project. So please continue. Uh, on the waste heat potential, we have mapped the EU28 and we have seen that there is 1.2 eta Joule available per year uh, to recover from our four heat sources. And this is more than 10% of the EU's total energy demand for heat and hot water. However, we use very little amounts of this volume today. If you want to read more, we have a deliverable on our web page. So there is heat out there. Uh, please change the slide. But uh, as an effect of different things, one being the lack of standardization, um, the recovery is limited. And we have um, limited empirical data. We will also hear from Rodriguez uh, later about um, the London experiences, which will be very interesting as well. But we see that there are no readily available systems off a shelf and each investment needs to be tailor made. So we need a demonstration across Europe. Next slide, please. And then there is an unclarity about the regulations to apply. What is waste heat? Is it a renewables? Should it be incentivized? Because renewables are incentivized. And what we have seen is that our urban waste heat recoveries uh, are competing with the incentivized renewable initiatives. And then what kind of permits are needed? Uh, in our demonstrator of the metro system, we encountered a situation where we needed um, permits of the same magnitude as when you want to make a big electricity uh, installation. And that is really not at pair uh, with what we wanted to do. So there are big hurdles. And this is quite surprising since waste heat recovery overall is no news because, uh, for example, in Sweden, where I come from, there are documentations of this kind of activity since 1974. So we really should have a review of the waste heat. What is it? So next slide, please. Yeah, and then we come to the fact that we have certain goals in the future and uh, the urban waste heat recovery solution is green and um, it should fit into the 2050 um, carbon neutrality um, desires of Europe um, because then there will be few other alternatives. However, there is still a low will to pay for green from the end user 
Um, even though we see that prosumers who own this kind of waste heat are becoming important players and drivers for green solutions. It's often them who come to the energy company and say, what can we do with this heat? And we also see that there are investors interested in green solutions. We have the Green Deal that was <clears throat> really coming before the Corona crisis. And now yesterday we have a support package and uh, I hope that there will be a continued interest in the green financing sector. Please take the next slide. So we see that there is funds out there. We have a nice quotation from one of the interviews we made with bankers in one of our work packages. We don't lack money, but we lack good projects to lend money to. And we have been discussing this uh, item, how can we make the investments happen um, a lot in the project. And we have identified that we need to solve three pieces of puzzle. So the first one is a language barrier. Somehow the industry and the bankers um, are not speaking the same language. The bankers or investors are um, not aware of the industry and as a result puts risk premia on top of risk premia when there should really not be one. So this barrier needs to be overcome to unlock the financing and also we need to start capitalizing on the value of green because it does have a value and it will be um, a very important factor in 2050. And then we also see that uh, the district heating investment is sometimes too small to appear on the radar of an investor. Um, and when a large investor is looking for green investment, uh, maybe they instead of picking a number of district heating projects that are ultra green, they end up with something larger that is gray green. So this is something we need to start addressing. What is the appropriate scale of the investment and what um, categorizations do we have to identify if the investment is bright green or gray green? And next slide, please. Yes. Thank you. So this was um, my reflection and our learnings from the Reuse Heat Project. Thank you for the attention. Any questions in the audience or from the panelists to Christina? Yes, there's a that question is. in the uh, Q&A app um, from Stefan. Uh, and is what is the standardization is lacking exactly? What standardization is lacking? Great, I didn't see the question until now. So uh, we have seen that there is a standardization both in terms of contractual uh, paperwork to be made. Every time you undertake this kind of investment, you need to draft a unique contract and that needs to change. And then also uh, standardization on um, how to make the installations would also facilitate because today there are very few um, technical consultants that can come in with a turnkey solution. So this kind of standardization on the technical side is also relevant. Christina, thank you very much. And uh, Stefan, is that, um, is that a good answer for your question? Well, otherwise we just continue after this meeting. Uh, and there's a second question. Second for question for yeah. Would it be possible, it be to, possible say to say what is meant by grey green investment? Yes, from so an anonymous yes. FMB. Should I answer mm -hmm. now or wait? Or yes, you want to? yes, please. Let's take a second. But, yeah. Okay. So, um, what I meant is that. Um, Sometimes uh, the choice goes to um, a conventional district heating technology. Uh, for example, it could be a CHP with biofuels, which is of course greener than coal, but it's not as green as it could be if you, have, uh, if you would resort to other heat sources like the urban waste heat source. Of course, that one is reliant on the greenness of electricity to operate heat pumps, which differs between countries as well. So you have to be very careful when you talk about ultra green or gray green. Thank you. Thank you for that answer, Christina. And thank you very much for this great presentation. Uh, it felt, felt like we were in a room. That's how clear your voice was in this. So okay, good. I'll, I will uh, leave the floor to Rolf. Uh, he's also part of, part of the urban 
energy transition partnership team looking into the funding, as you, Christina. And Rolf has looked in another angle, and he would now present shortly about uh, from the financial investor perspective. Rolf, uh, the floor is yours, and welcome. Yes, thank you, Magnus and, uh, and Emilia, for, for setting up this conference call and for, for inviting us. Um, we have indeed been working over the past uh, period together with, with you, Magnus, in, in, um, in trying to, um, uh, to work with the financial sector, not necessarily investors, mm -hmm. rather financiers on understanding where they see uh, the needs and the trends in the district heating market. Um, so that's, uh, and I think our, um, our insights and conclusions resonate very much with what was just presented by, uh, by Christina. Uh, next slide, please. I think overall, I think on, on, um, at, at a global level, but also within Europe, there is a, there's absolutely no shortage of, um, of uh, financing available for, for bankable projects. I think that's, a, and that's the, of course, a combination of, of challenge. Um, it actually has led at, um, at a global level to such a high competition for to place um, uh, financing that the, uh, the rates have dropped uh, to such a level that for some lenders it's uh, uh, simply less interesting to work on extremely long-term uh, projects uh, like energy infrastructure. This, uh, this gap is partially filled in by new entrants to that market. For example, pension funds who do have a very explicit uh, commitment to, uh, to long-term uh, uh, economic systems, for example, in specific geography and to very, very stable uh, and potentially low results. Um, so that's, um, that's an interesting new development where we see that those organizations are also more interested in, um, in supporting uh, new district heating systems rather than buying up uh, existing systems. Um, at the same time, those new systems often have to be green or, or super green. Um, and, and, but it's well known, of course, that the securing supply for those solutions is, uh, is seen as a major challenge. Um, on the next slide, though, we see what when, when talking to um, to participants in, in let's say project development uh, trajectories, we see um, some let's say recurring comments. But I think first of all, it's, uh, it was interesting to see that also by the EIB, but it was also reflected by some larger uh, larger lenders across Europe. The financing models for for district heating have not changed that much over the past uh, decades. It's um, so that the financing for infrastructure has been fairly standard. It's a, perhaps a matter of some new technologies and um, new players but the basic economics are, are the same. Um, and one of the challenges there is that um, uh, most commercial uh, lenders, they mostly look at large scale infrastructure projects. Uh, so that means they have a threshold before getting actively engaged in project uh, uh, financing, which uh, clashes very often with, um, uh, with the, the bankability and the viability in an early stage. So when you look at the, the, the kind of consultancies that are typically involved in, 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 in setting up uh, financial models around a, a new initiative, um, uh, they, they notice what, um, what has been said before. It's uh, very often tailor-made, which makes it complex and very uh, time-consuming. And at the same time, there's, uh, there seems to be, an, an, uh, especially from level of politicians, an, an, uh, an ambition that goes further than what is financially viable. Um, so on the next slide is a, a, I think, a very interesting example for this case from um, uh, from Ireland, where a number of initiatives and or, or the potential business cases were analyzed for for viability and what's uh, what the outcome is that there's just a very small number of projects shown here on the bottom uh, left side of the diagram have a, that have an obvious uh, cost benefit uh, as a better cost benefit potential than say, existing energy systems. Obviously, often connected to uh, to um, waste heat or in dense uh, urban centers. Uh, there's a very large number of projects that could be break even over longer periods of time, mostly also in metropolitan cities, and that's uh, metropolitan areas. And what we notice is that very often projects are designed from a too large scale to make obvious sense for uh, to make them obvious bankable. So what the um, uh, the realistic projects often are more small, uh, with a very specific source. And with a very specific uh, technology risk or energy and, 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 and buyer risk to be analyzed. On the next slide, it shows that 
some that's also where the new uh, let's say market models are uh, we see emerging uh, for example as mentioned before it is uh, the larger pension funds which are actively entering the markets uh, an example is a dutch uh, pension fund pggm who've uh, become a major shareholder in a um, in a company that creates uh, greenfield small-scale greenfield energy systems so now in the netherlands but also moving to other countries like uh, spain and in the uk always an optive when it comes to to financing financial models is the five co model where um small-scale investments are aggregated and and um and actually offered to um uh, to capital they're refinanced on capital markets so that that uh, creates a financial break between the the, the time for payback that the original investors see. Uh, Rol, do you have the possibility to close so we in the next minute so we can have time for some questions? Yeah. We're at the last slide. Yeah. Next one. Yeah, next thank one. you. <laughs> Uh, so in this in this market where projects small scale projects are more viable, tangible, often can make benefit make use of, of waste heat, so they're also more green. And a financial market that is still mostly focused on large scale projects, what could Celsius do? Celsius uh, do? I think that the, the, again reflecting Christina's and other comments, uh, standardization in project assessments, both in uh, to to facilitate due diligence. Um, I think here a very interesting example to look into is the the energy efficiency in in buildings sector, where the EFIC, the Financial Institutions, Energy Efficiency Financial Institutions Group has has led the way for an industry standards of describing and benchmarking energy projects. So the whole categorization becomes easier. I think that's uh, um, uh, technical systems that covers costs in early stage feasibility studies. Still at European level, is it's only suitable for very large projects and not yet tailored to small scale projects. And I think here Celsius could have a role to play in working with the European Commission to uh, to either aggregate local projects into larger uh, technical assistance programs or otherwise change, change policies. And finally, but that's, uh, it was mentioned before, but it's difficult to arrange. The value of green investments uh, does not yet um, lead very large premium. I mean, cost of capital is low um, and that will change, uh, not change for the, in the coming period, but still it's a worthwhile topic for Celsius to rest with the commission. Thank you for your uh, attention, everyone. Are there any questions? There's one question here, Emilia. Could you please uh, read that to Rolf, see if we can have a quick answer on that? Okay. Of course. What role do you see for additional legislation to allow for private businesses to gain access to existing district heating owned by cities or countries uh, from an anonymous attendee? Yeah, so one of the uh, one of the more interesting uh, models that we see happening is where very often networks have a single supplier. So there's not a lot of competition and a limited possibility to add new uh, new sources to, it, to the existing network. So a new regulation that would make it uh, simpler to create local energy markets, um, adding new capacity to uh, to an existing network would be very welcome. Yeah. All right, we we got one more question here, but I think we will need to save that later on because that's a I think our next speakers will uh, talk about national aggregation. Um, and uh, and also Simon, maybe we can keep this question later on because we can also talk from a UK perspective some some good uh, examples. Uh, Rolf, thank you very much for this, and of course we call it Julia for all the work behind this uh, material. Uh, now now we have sort of talked from a general perspective the issues. Uh, we heard the work which uh, Simon is leading uh, from urban identity perspective. We also heard Christina talk from the challenges uh, from a city perspective and the utility perspective when it comes to heating and cooling, district heating and cooling. And you heard uh, Rolf now talk about from investor perspective. I think it's super interesting talks. So thank you very much and very good questions from the audience. Now, why don't have some success stories or some key learnings where we actually gone from you go from ideas to uh, proof of concepts and to commissioning. Uh, you will hear Rodrigo. We will leave the floor to you in 10 seconds, Rodrigo. And then we will hear uh, Fred Frederick Bloch, who is uh, Treasury, and we'll talk about it from an investment perspective from the city side, how they work with the green bonds and how they aggregate uh, green investments. It's all right. So thank you very much. And uh, Rodrigo, the floor is yours.
if we can hear you. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me there? Yes. Oh, yes. So, so, sorry about that. I don't know what happened there. Um, thank you very much, um, um, Magnus, for, 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 the, for the invite and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, we're going to quickly, I've got a presentation to talk a little bit about, uh, yeah, this um, uh, the success story about Von Hill. Um, so I'm going to go quite quickly through my slides. I'm supposed to have control of the slides. Um, let's see if I can. Yeah, I think it works now. So um, there are quite a few slides and um, we're just going to skip through most uh, quickly through them. Um, well, skip through a couple of them. Well, just a local context in case you, you, you don't know about East LinkedIn. Um, yes, we're one of the boroughs of London. So it's a very, very tiny uh, geographical area. So, um, but it's, it's the, the, the most densely populated borough in the UK. And uh, yeah, with, a, with a, density, a population density comparable to Paris. So. And uh, we have very ambitious um, decarbonization targets. So we were supposed to be um, uh, carbon free or carbon neutral by 2030. And we have some higher than normal fuel poverty levels. And that's one of the main main drivers for us to be um, interested in heat networks. Um, back in 2012, we commissioned our first um, um, heat network. We call it Bun Hill Heat and Power. Uh, the first energy center was a uh, two megawatt uh, CHP engine, um, and it yeah it was a it was a great success story. Uh, it worked worked pretty well, still working for pretty well. So eight years down the road and still working. So yeah, I think I think we did something right, and that make us think about how to expand the network. And then we came up obviously well in uh, Celsius trigger the um, development of the second energy center, which is Bun Hill 2, which we were um, able to commission successfully a couple of weeks ago, literally. So this is a real picture of, um, of um, the energy center. Uh, here we have in this second energy center, we have a one megawatt heat pump um, and two um, supplementary um, CHP engines, 250 roughly, 250 kilowatts each, so another 500 kilowatts of uh, CHP capacity, um, 35 cubic meter of thermal store, and we expanded a network an extra kilometer around the area. So in total, this new energy center will is supplying home to another roughly another 600 homes. In total, we're <clears throat> we're serving about at the moment we're serving about 1,200 homes between the two energy centers and potentially. Well, we're just about to, to connect another big private development, which will bring another thousand homes roughly. So um, that's that's the story. I'm not going to concentrate that much into the details of the technical details about, about um, Bond Hill, sorry. Uh, just, but just for you, to, for those who are not entirely familiar about what the, um, what the system is about, basically we're extracting heat from the tube. So we um, there there was there was a disused um, ventilation shaft, a disused um, tube station um, that was used was used only as a as a ventilation shaft with a big fan. It was extracting heat from the from the underground, and basically we replaced the heat, the fan. We put a much much bigger one. So we brought the capacity of the fan from 17, 17 cubic meters to seventy seven zero cubic meters per second. And then we, this big building that you have here, that, that, you have, that we can see here on the right side of the building is the head house. That's, that's where the coils are. We force the air through that and then we extract the heat and then we, we um, raise the temperature a little bit more if needed with uh, CHP engines and then we inject it into the network. Um, so basically this um, Bonny Hill was a really, really um, uh, innovative, it is a very innovative project. And, but it was also a very, very complicated one for many, many reasons. It was the first of its kind. It was um, difficult to conceive, to design, and it took a long time. The truth is that, I'm not gonna go into the details, um, but, but, but the truth is that we, we, it, took us a it took us longer than expected, almost three years longer than expected to commission this, this project. And obviously there were some really significant cost implications that were not considered in the first place. So. Um, it was it was it was a very very interesting project. So I'm here in some of the photos of the of the process. Um, but it took us it took us um, 
it, it, it was, it, it took us through a journey in which we had to, well, challenge ourselves a couple of times. We had to, at, at many, many different levels, because obviously we needed the, the, the political backup, the financial backup, and also the technical commitment from the council and all, every, all, the, all the parties involved to make, the, to make this happen. So <clears throat> the truth is, um, we're happy, we're really, really happy to have it up and running, but also uh, it gave us, it, 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 how can I say this? The council ended up being a little bit uh, ex skeptical about new developments because of the long time it took us and because of the long, um, the additional investment. But still, we have to deliver all these targets that we have um, on becoming a, a zero net carbon borrower by 2030. We still need to deliver another, well, that's a plan to deliver another 15 heat networks across Islington by that time, by 2030. We still need to expand Bun Hill. So we want to have Bun Hill 2 and 3 and 4 and more energy centers. And obviously we need to decarbonize uh, the heat. So we need to replace the CHP engine we have for something else. And also the, uh, we have new emitterian regulation coming in. And basically that all requires a lot of capital money that at the moment we don't have. That's, that's, the, real, that's the reality of, of, of Islington right now. And, uh, and probably for a lot of local authorities, there's no capital money to invest in all this, or there's very, very little, definitely not the, the amount of money that we as an organization need to invest in order to make all this happen. So what are the alternatives? So what's, what are we gonna do about this? About this? So for the first time, at least in Islington, we're thinking about changing, changing the approach, the approach, partnering with the private sector and deliver new projects along the part of the private sector in a way that in a way that we were not um, not used to do in the past. So how thinking about developing something, we were budgeting it getting the funds from whatever we could, and then we were buying and keeping the asset. The truth is that for heat networks, as a local authority, we have very different drivers. It's, well, not very different drivers, but it's, we don't, our primary driver is not just the financial driver, the commercial driver. We need to deliver on fuel poverty, and we need to deliver on carbon emissions. We need to reduce our carbon emissions, which that makes it an ideal position to partner with someone who has a commercial driver, and partnering together, we can definitely think about delivering all these this, all this, all this new projects. But it will require changing the model and changing the approach. So at the moment, the way we're thinking of, of going forward is basically um, creating ESCOs and joint ventures. There are many, many, many different levels of integration between the private and the public sector, depending on the, on the risk and the control that you want to keep. And one of the problems that we used to have is that there was no regulation in place. So basically, as a local authority, you needed to have more control because you cannot just let someone else to take it and, and you, you, because you could end up leaving a lot of people vulnerable to all this. And with a heat network, something you cannot just replace from one day to another. Now, new regulation is coming in. So definitely it's helping to, 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 to have a much more um, relaxed, interaction with the private with the private sector and will also increase the level of flexibility in these type of partnerships um, we definitely want to try and 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 go for a new a new approach and how how we're going to prove that well we're working on a new project right now that is called green skies i won't talk too much about it but basically it's it's a new project that tries to integrate different technologies recover and reuse heat in the local community. In the local community. But integrating Integr and making it self-sustainable within the local context. We're gonna be successful. We're trying to, we're trying to, within the next two years, we're gonna be putting together all the pieces and we're gonna be finding the right partners to, to, make, this, to make this happen from a financial point of view. Again, the council will try to value its, its strategic position within the within the partnership within the within the process of developing this 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 process this project, but uh, we will definitely need someone to cover the gap in funding 
in order to to make the, to make this a reality. Rodrigo, do you yep. have the possibility to close in about half an hour, a half, thirty seconds, one minute? Yeah, yeah, no, do? yeah. Basically, that that was that was it. I mean, I didn't I, I didn't have much time to go into into detail, uh, but basically, I just wanted to give like the general overview of what what. What what the what is the future for us in terms of developing new projects with Green Skies? We want to deliver all these different different things. We want to deliver uh, low carbon energy. We want to deliver fifth generation heat network. We want to enhance and create the local energy market. All this without having to put money from the local council. So we're opening up the model to private investors to the public set to the private sector. Uh, to come and work with us and try to try, try to deliver all these all these all these things so it's a very high level view from from of, of the current uh, situation and the way we want to move forward but um, but yeah we'll be more than happy to answer any any questions Rodrigo, uh, yeah thank you very much for this this is a great presentation I feel when you present it you, you sort of say that it took longer time and it's uh, it's, of course, it's been difficult to understand, but I mean, you should you should know uh, that uh, a lot of us today has been part of the Celsius initiative, Celsius for a long time, and you're one of the few success cases going from a good proof of concept to commissioning. So uh, I think that don't beat too hard on yourself. Uh, <laughs> you've done great work. And I think the majority of us around the table in this uh, webinar is really interested in looking forward how you continue this work. Maybe there's a lot of key learnings for others how, how to continue and uh, this public partner schemes which are presenting. We're super interested in following this project or this investment. So, I mean, not only have you gone from an idea to proof of concept, you had commissioned it and now you're looking at replication and scalability so uh yeah uh, hands off uh, no hand what do you call it in english uh applause for you um Hello. Th thank you thank you very much um uh, yeah i will appreciate if you could tell that to my bosses but <laughs> yeah, no. Do that. Uh, no thank you thank you very much you know i i i, I yeah definitely this was a very very um interesting project interesting. From, from many many perspectives and it was a difficult one and uh, i think i think the truth is that nobody no when we started designing this this project nobody really um knew all the complexities around it and um it's it's difficult to design it's, it's always difficult to design something um to do some civil engineering in a very densely populated um uh, area yeah. and on top of that all the innovation and all the new the new Parts so of the new the new stuff that we were putting together, yeah, it was definitely was a challenge, but a really good challenge. And I think the value of the learning it's it's, it's huge, and something we're more than happy to share and to yeah to to yeah to tell about. Yeah, to tell. So more than we, more than happy to to talk about it in different we, we different will, forms. We we will continue all of you, and uh, you probably there will be information regarding all the demonstrators presented here and their success in the Celsius initiative by the down uh, Thank you very much. We don't have any time for any questions, but I just want to say that we're running about five minutes late. So we will end this session at 1.05. I'm sorry about that, uh, but uh, let's, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Frederick. And, uh, welcome, thank welcome you very much. Frederick, uh, welcome. Uh, you, you are from another perspective in the city. Um, you will present from a treasury perspective and how Gothenburg works, the city of Gothenburg works with the green bonds, which you will actually had the UN climate award for developing down the road some years ago. And uh, it also been part of uh, funding one of uh, the heating and cooling projects in Gothenburg. But you will, you will talk from another perspective. So Frederick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, let's uh, see this from a more financial perspective in how to finance the sustainable investment. Uh, my name is Frederick Bloch. I work as a portfolio manager in the city of Gothenburg, where uh, my basic job is to borrow money. And there are different ways of doing that. And one way of doing it is through green bonds. Next slide, please. 
Chair Wesley, switch, Frederick, could you uh, speak closer to the microphone, please? Yes, is this better? A little bit better. Okay, let me try. So I want to start with a picture of Gothenburg from above where we see the ferry going to, I guess, Denmark or Germany. Uh, we've been a sustainable city open to the world. That's been the city strategy for uh, six years now. So if we are to be considered a green city or the greenest city in the earth, I think that that is due to our long history of green investment in this city. Next slide, please. And so green bonds, uh, it's a success story. And as uh, I was introduced by city, the city of Gothenburg was the first city in the world to issue green bonds. And that was uh, seven years ago now. And it was, uh, it was, um, Hard in the beginning, we tried everything. There was no roadmap, so we just continued doing it. And nowadays, as you can see in this uh, slide, a third of all bonds issued in Sweden by municipalities and counties are green. And so that speaks for itself. Almost every city who has a bond program in Sweden has a green bond uh, program. So it's not a question if should we do green bonds or not. If you do bonds, you should, of course, also do green bonds. Next slide, please. And I just want to show you, since we've been doing green bonds for uh, seven years now, we have a green investment portfolio of over 10 billion Swedish crowns. And I, with this picture, I want to show you that the majority or three quarters of all our green investments are in some kind of a building. The Celsius product uh, we see as an energy efficiency investment and that is a very very small amount in this total um, investment portfolio. Next slide please. So what is the green bond process? I'm just gonna very shortly go through the major steps in uh, how we work with green bonds. And at the, at the first thing you do at the top to the left is you set up a framework. And there was a question before, what is a green investment? And the framework is the key document to state what is considered to be a green investment and what is not. And when we write the framework, there is a, a second party opinion. In our case, it's Tistero, who has given our framework a medium shade of green. And that's because we have such a wide variety of investment. I know the city of Reykjavik has been able to get a dark green uh, framework, but that was not possible for us. And when we have the framework set, we do the project evaluation, we find the investment in the whole city, and then we try to keep, keep uh, the data on where the money has uh, gone through the management of proceeds. And the biggest job in this is to do the impact reporting, where we show the uh, environmental benefits of every, every invest investment we have done. Next slide, please. And this is the framework, just a picture, but on the right hand side, you can see our green project categories. Now it's renewable energy, green buildings, energy efficiency, and so on. So if you have any questions, if, uh, if an investment could be considered green or not, you're very welcome to see our framework. Our framework is uh, pretty new, so this is, kind of like the ma uh, market standard of what is considered to be green. Next, please. And this is how the evaluation. We have all these investments in the city and we afterwards see if the investment could be, uh, could be seen as green or not. 
and it's very important, it's very tempting to widen the funnel, but that would be greenwashing to say that uh, most investments we do are green. So it's very, very important that you keep a strict line and don't accept the projects that are so somewhat semi green. Next, please. Frederick, just, just a question here. Is it better um, better rates with the green bonds than uh, other bonds? How do you see the capital on the market? Yes, a success story in the green bond market is that if we get a very slight discount or a greenium, as we call it, a green premium, when we issue green bonds. But it's very, very small, but I think it's a symbolic gesture showing that the demand for a green investment is way bigger than we are being able to find green products. There was a, a quote by an earlier presenter here today stating, we don't like money, we like good projects. And that is my view of it too. It's, not, it's very easy to borrow money in general, and it's extra easy to borrow green money. The biggest challenge for us is to find the green investment. So, and everybody could help in uh, showing your city's treasury that we have a green project coming up and just to inform the whole organization what the investments are about. Thank you. And this page, I just show you the impact report. It, everything can be seen on our uh, web page, but it's a big job. Because if you state that you have made a green investment and you borrow green money, you have to prove in some way that you can show an environmental benefit of every investment that you have done. So there's a bit, it's time consuming and it's, uh, it's, it's hard work sometimes. Next, please. And so just to wrap it up, should, should we do green bonds or not? Well, do you finance the investments by, by bonds or loans? If you do bonds, it's easy. Just do green bonds. If you do it by loans, you can go to the EIB, the European Investment Bank, who declare themselves to be the green bank, and hopefully you can get a discount in borrowing money from the EIB uh, due to these special green investments. And it's very important that your overall um, organization or your city have a green ambition. You cannot just pick one project out and say, let's do a green bond. You need to be a green city. Otherwise, there'll be a reputational uh, risk in this. And what investment project could be considered green? I hopefully most investment done now are in some, some way sustainable. So I do not believe it's going to be hard to find green investment for any city in Europe. And you set up a green framework and you don't have to do it yourself. The banks love it. They will do most of the work and everyone will applaud you if you start and set up a green bond framework. And the small discount. My suggestion is that you, should, that you give that discount to the one who is producing the investment. Show the in uh, organization that if we can borrow green, we borrow cheaper. It's a very slight discount, but it, it's there anyway. Next slide, please. And then uh, I just want to show you, uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but the city is uh, reaching for the one and a half degree target, so we will we must do a lot of investment in the city. And the first step is to get a full fossil-free vehicle fleet owned by the city. And that's just three, three years away. So that is mainly our focus now in the electricity vehicle. Next slide, please. And this is our homepage where you can find all the details about green bonds and all the processes and all our impact report. And you're very welcome to uh, get in touch with me if you have a question. We're eager to share best practice and we see, we hopefully see more cities doing green bonds in the future. 
<laughs> Thank you, Frederick. Thank you for a great talk, a great presentation. Uh, we need to do a virtual applause for all the speakers. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, Simon has uh, one a question here, uh, then I need to wrap it up. Uh, he asked, uh, from, is the administration reporting requirements needed for green bonds much greater than traditional bonds? I think maybe you answered that uh, la later on. But, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's a lot more work with the green bond. And that the popularity with green bonds is due to the transparency. For the first time, the investor knows exactly where the money goes. And this is the future. In, the, in, in 10 or 15 years, the anonymous money will be gone. So we have to follow all the money and report on their sustainability uh, effects. So uh, the future is green. Uh, I, no doubt about it. Thank you, Frederick. That, that's a great final comment from, uh, from your presentation. Uh, I, I need to wrap this up. First of all, thank you everybody for having this, being here today and presenting. It's been great. And this is a step for, forward. I mean, this is the one piece of the step. This is a sneak peek what we will present for European Commission. And, but of course, one thing is to write white papers, the other thing is to do real stuff. So we will continue as always to try to do real stuff and continue having the hands in the ground and try to get those projects commenced to, or to support in a way, that kind of work. Before we close, uh, uh, the last, I would like to give one last, first uh, hand to Emilia who's been doing this, running it well, thank you very much, Emilia. And then I would like to ask all the, all the speakers to say, one thing, what you like to give the audience, uh, which you think is a, your key message for the future. Very rude of me asking that this late, but uh, Simon, <laughs> do you dare say one, uh, one, one, what do you think we should bring from this meeting? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know what, one thing, if we're thinking about um, district energy networks, for me would be thinking really hard about not only their role in providing heat to buildings, but their role in providing flexibility and balancing to, to the wider energy system. Yeah, so the integrated in energy system. Yeah. Yeah, a big Thank role play in electricity network as well as providing heat. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Christina. Yes, I think we should struggle to phase out fossil fuels. And I just realized that there is this uh, corona recovery um, package that came yesterday. We should really push in that to not build any more fossil energy, more district heating. Thank you. Thank you. Rolf. I think there's a lot of experience uh, across Europe and across different organizations and institutions that seem still very fragmented. So I would, uh, I would ask all participants to keep on working with the Celsius network to make sure that that knowledge and expertise is, uh, is accessible for all future uh, developers of district heat networks. Thank you, Rob. Very good comment. And we will try to have all of this on. We have all the contact information and also the progress we do will be presented on the Celsius initiative. Um, so it will be found there. And of course, we will continue. This is the first of uh, many sessions together. Thanks. And Rodrigo. Uh, um, thank you. Just, thank as you. Last Just as a last thought. We have to, we I, have think to we have I think we have to see um, um, district heating as, heating as we're not just delivering heat, but we're, all bu we're building infrastructure for, for the city's infrastructure for the future. And that, that, changes, the, um, that changes the perspective on, on, the, on, the, on the value of, of whatever, whatever we're, we're doing. So, so yeah, I think we should definitely think about it as, as we're building infrastructure for the future, not just delivering low carbon heat or low cost heat. to recap anything sorry sorry I, I didn't hear you Magnus what he said sorry oh, I was uh, last that's last uh, comment from Frederick are there any last comment Frederick well keep up the good work the future is sustainable and uh, we're gonna do uh, work in every frontier to uh, 
help uh, all investments to become sustainable? It's a really easy question. Just do it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I thought of taking that last word, uh, but I think I'll leave that with you, Frederick. Uh, that was a very good last punchline. I think we leave the, the seminar with this. Please continue sending your questions to us. Uh, and uh, and let's meet you out there. Hopefully we see you soon in, uh, in real life. Uh, otherwise, we continue to meet in this way.